Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining ECPAT USA's webinar on engaging technology to prevent online child exploitation. My name is Lori Cohen. I am the CEO of ECPAT USA, which for 30 years has been at the forefront of advocacy to prevent the commercial sexual exploitation of children in the United States. We are one of 104 countries affiliated with ECPAT International, and we share the common goal to end these crimes against children and promote every child's right to live a life free from violence as espoused in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The theme of this year's Commission on the Status of Women innovation and technical change and education in the digital age for achieving gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls presents a timely platform for discussing the complex opportunities and challenges that children encounter in a world where one in three children under 18 use the internet. UNICEF reports that by the age of 10, young people are more likely to use the internet than adults at any age beyond 25. In the United States, access to the internet is dramatically higher. In 2019, 95% of children ages three to 18 had internet access, 88% of them through computers, tablets, and smartphones. Parents in a poll from this past November of 2022 reported that one in five children ages nine to 15 stream videos and play video games for, hold on to your seats, more than six hours a day. There is no doubt that digital technology is providing exciting opportunities for stimulating young minds, for educational enhancement, and for the normal activities of having fun that are part of childhood. Unfortunately, this widespread access to the internet makes ch children's easy mastery of their tools and the omnipresence of social media have also expanded opportunities for sophisticated sexual predators and criminals to lure children into risky and dangerous situations. The isolation created by COVID only exacerbated the threats posed to children in their online activities. Surfing the web, clicking on ads, using social media, and significantly gaming can lead children to undesirable places, including encounters with predators. Exacerbated by the pandemic, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reported a 97.5% increase in online enticement of children in 2020 compared to reports from the same time period in the previous year, 97.5% increase, so nearly double. <laughs> uh, in response, ECPAT USA created manuals that have been widely used by students, parents, and teachers to identify and prevent potential online exploitation. Today's webinar will present an exciting new toolbox, new tool in the toolbox that harnesses digital technology to the prevention of child sexual exploitation, keeping children safe while engaging their interest and expanding their education. Now, I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker on this panel, because as all of us working in the non-NGO space know, prevention efforts for online child abuse are chronically underfunded. In the past decade, for example, on one half of the federally appropriated funds, actually only one half of the federally appropriated funds have actually been authorized by the Justice Department. Supplementary state funds have been inadequate to meet the task. And for that reason, we are extremely excited and grateful to welcome a significant new partner 
from the private sector, a sector where many of us typically don't look for these types of innovative partnerships. So it is with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Paul Pelizzari, who is the Vice President of Global Social Responsibility at Hard Rock International. And uh, I'm extremely uh, proud to mention a member of ECPAT USA's Board of Directors. Thank you, Paul, and welcome. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, it's really an honor to be here and uh, want to thank the uh, Commission on the Status of Women for organizing the session and for Lori for inviting us to be part of it. Um, we're going to talk about this um, innovative partnership that we've um, been working on with ECPAT and, and others. Um, and if, I'm going to um, just give a bit of context for um, our approach as Hard Rock and as a, a global company. And uh, just sharing my screen here, hopefully that's coming up. Um, is that my screen appearing there, Lori? It is. Okay, great. Um, so as Lori said, uh, we are, we're a private sector company. We are a global company and uh, our role in this space is, uh, is particular and it really relies on great rela relationships and cross-sectoral partnerships. So that's a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today in terms of how we tackle this issue of online exploitation. And to just provide a bit of uh, background, um, a little bit of background on Hard Rock and where we come from, because it's very important uh, who we are as a company um, our culture and our priorities. So just a bit of background on the company. Uh, for those who may not know, uh, it was started in 1971 by two self-described American hippies who were living in London, England at the time. And in 1971, London, England was the sort of global center for rock music. And uh, the two founders, and the, those are the gentlemen you're seeing there, Isaac Tigret and Peter Morton, they wanted to create a place uh, in London that served all kinds of people. The world that they saw there was Working people went to the pub and more posh people went to fancy restaurants. They wanted a place where, as they described it, bankers could hang out with bakers. And so they created this American dining establishment that celebrated rock and, rock and roll music. They were um, in, this, in the heart of the music scene there. And at the time, uh, members of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Eric Clapton and the Who all started to hang out there. And why this is important to go into, because music is the essence of who we are. And two things that we're known for, one is our music memorabilia collection. It started when Eric Clapton gave a guitar to the hard rock owners and said, I don't need this anymore. Why don't you guys do something with it? They put it on the wall and that started our music memorabilia collection, which is now over 80,000 pieces globally. The other thing that was important for um, the founders of the company was to create what we today would call a sense of social, social purpose. We didn't have that language back then, but the founders created four mottos that had become a touch point for everyone who has ever worked for Hard Rock. And when you look at these mottos, love all, serve all, save the planet, take time to be kind and all is one, they are um, an attempt to express ideals that try to connect people with a greater sense of being and a greater sense of purpose. And they really have mattered to the company. And one of the first things that they did was they were, got very involved in their community. So philanthropy has been part of Hard Rock since day one. We're also very well known globally for our t-shirts and merchandise. The very first Hard Rock t-shirt was a t-shirt for a soccer team or a European football team um, for um, under, underprivileged youth in London. And that was the origin uh, of the company. So these things go back uh, a long way in terms of who we are, the connection to community, the attention to social need. Move ahead to uh, 2007. Um, so the company today were 200 plus locations of cafes, hotels, and casinos, music venues, and retail shops in 68 countries. And that expansion really has come since 2007 when we were acquired by the Seminole Tribe of Florida. So for those who don't know, we are our 100% owner is the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And uh, the the importance of this for what we're going to talk about today in terms of human trafficking is, is very significant. Um, if you don't know this history of the Seminole tribe, it's a very um, interesting, compelling, poignant one. Uh, not only has it been a marginalized community for much of its history, it was subjected to genocide. And in the decades following uh, the, the end of that genocidal campaign, um, they, they work to persevere and to uh, be resilient. And they are today a sovereign government. And they're very proud of the fact that they never um, surrender to the US government. And so they have an unconquered spirit and unconquered vision, which is very important to everything that they do. 
Why this is important is because an issue like human trafficking disproportionately affects indigenous communities among other communities. And so as we started to tackle this issue as a company, the tribe's direction and support was very critical. And when we think about a cross-sectoral relationship, Hard Rock being a global business and a sovereign government uh, as our owner was a very important um, foundation for this work. And then enter ECPAT, the third partner in this journey. Um, and we are trying to leverage all the strengths and values uh, of each of our organizations. So again, when we're a business, um, uh, any company that is trying to address a critical social need, such as um, tackling human trafficking, must understand what it means for it as a business. And for, for us, human trafficking is, is something that affects hotels and casinos around the world. Doesn't matter if they're a fancy hotel or if they are a uh, lower cost hotel, motel by the side of the road, um, these crimes are going on everywhere. And acknowledging this and saying this is a very important first step for the industry because it's an uncomfortable topic, but it's really only the first step. Um, it's important for our company to not only acknowledge this, but to actually be part of the dialogue and be part of the solutions to addressing this horrible crime that happens on our properties. So Hard Rock as a company, we seek to build social strengths where we can and where it matters. And we want to attend to pressing social needs. And again, this is part of who we are on an ongoing basis. Two other examples I'll give of the Seminole Tribe of Florida and Hard Rock uh, addressing pressing social needs. During COVID, um, the tribe um, we did not lay off masses of employees. Even though our business ground to a halt, um, they retained people. They made sure that there were economic supports, um, grocery supports for our team members. When vaccines became available, the tribe made those vaccines very available very early on to our employees. Um, in September of 2022, the tribe and Hard Rock announced that we were increasing the minimum wage of our employees to $18 an hour. There was a social need going on in terms of people being able to make a living wage. And so we made sure that people who were busing tables and working in housekeeping had a living wage. And so across the board, we increased it to $18 an hour, adding $100 million to our payroll. But again, in both cases, there's a social need that, that if, if we help people reduce their anxiety, help them live better, they will, they will be better for our business. So turning to human trafficking, it's a very similar issue for us. It's material to our operations. We don't want it as part of the experience that we give guests. We don't want people to sense that there's something going on where, where trafficking is happening. And we don't wanna be part of a horrendous crime that perpetuates the human misery and suffering of, of those that it touches. So a key thing that we can do with the social identity quest and other things that we're doing is actually being out in front and talking about it as a business. And this is not something that is necessarily easy at first for a company to do. Um, as I was advancing a lot of these initiatives, had discussions with senior executives saying, well, why do we want to be out there talking about this in a more prominent way than other people in our, in our sector? And very quickly, um, the conversation turned to the, the real opportunities for us to address the issue and to make people understand that we are doing something um, and playing our role. And our role really as a business is to, um, is to leverage the work of organizations like ECPAT, extend the great work that they're doing and to reach people because we are a global company. So for us, before uh, embarking upon something like the social identity quest, we had to define what it meant for us as a company. And we had to make sure that we were doing things in our operations that made us credible in the space. So in fact, we first met ECPAT when we engage them on the amazing um, training program that they offer um, uh, to everyone in the hospitality space. Uh, and that became a standard training program for 27,000 employees working in hard rock hotels and casinos. Um, that training is an ongoing endeavor. We're constantly refreshing information and providing more um, awareness to our team members. We also need to provide supports for victims and, uh, and survivors. I'll talk a bit more about that. But the key thing for the social identity quest, the online education program that we've been embarking upon is let's get out and try to prevent the problem before it happens, because that's as important as us mitigating the problems that we see in our operations. So just to give a bit of background on some of the other things that we're doing for victims and survivors, um, we've introduced a QR code that was created by survivors for victims on our properties. So we are piloting this at four um, casinos and hotels. Uh, allowing victims who may see it in discrete places like washrooms to scan their phone and get immediate help if they need it. 
Since introducing this in the first six weeks, we had almost a thousand scans of the code. We had six reports go to law enforcement and Homeland Security in the US opened up one investigation to try to help uh, a survivor. We are looking to extend this QR code across all of our properties. This is a simple thing that we can do to help people who are um, potentially being trafficked on our properties. Another thing that we can do, a great exciting partnership we have with Covenant House, um, which is a homeless shelter across uh, North America. Uh, they, uh, they shelter homeless youth and they try to help get them back on their feet. As I'm sure many of you know, um, homeless youth are at risk for and in, indeed trafficked um, uh, greater proportions than other youth. So what we wanna do is try to provide them employment, give somebody a job and it will help them with their vulnerabilities. We are now employing homeless youth in the city of New York at two of our properties there to try to prevent trafficking from happening. So that's background on Hard Rock and the Seminole Tribe of Florida and why we're addressing this issue. I wanna now turn to our program with, uh, with uh, ECPAT, and this is the social identity quest. You're gonna get a demonstration of this in a moment, but I'm just gonna provide a bit of context for why we are engaging with ECPAT uh, on this program. I should also mention another partner to this, which is uh, an organization called Edu Network Partners. They are the online creative agency that created the program uh, and, and, and a great organization to work with. But when we started off with this, why do we wanna engage in this, in this very important issue? Well, Lori gave a good background on what the, the potential crisis is for youth being lured. That matters, it's a key population. We want to make sure that we are helping to address uh, prevention in those areas. And prevention needs to be part of what companies do. Um, and uh, so along with, uh, with being um, trying to educate so that prevention uh, uh, contributes to, to youth not being lured, it's also important for us to be part of the public discussion. In my view, human trafficking is at a point, particularly in the United States, where it's being discussed and companies with our reach and our leverage can be part of this um, part of this effort. And then the other thing I just wanna say uh, in terms of ECPAT and, and Hard Rock's um, uh, collaboration, we both share an interest in reaching the audience in the right way. And so we've carefully designed this program to make sure we're, we're engaging youth and not alienating them. We also set specific outcomes and specific targets for what we wanted to do. So we measure all the uh, outcomes that we're achieving. Uh, some output measures, we've reached 1.2 million students in the United States. Uh, 60,000 teachers have taken up this program, spending between a half an hour and an hour and a half uh, engaging youth on it. And um, uh, you'll hear from Christian uh, Toila from ECPAT talk about the design of the program and the educational impact of it. We did a pre and post survey and measured that 13% increase in online safety literacy. These measures are very important to show that we're actually making a difference. And uh, ECPAT's contribution, uh, I can't say enough about it. The great work that they were doing in classrooms is what led, led us to have conversations around what can we do, how can we leverage that great work, and the focus on the audience. They have provided um, survivor councils to vet all the content. They've provided youth panels because we need to make sure that we're able to reach the audiences we want to talk to in, in manners that are effective and are gonna ensure that we can um, help reduce the risk of online literacy. So thanks very much for that, Lori. I'm going to pass it back uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's just um, so moving, uh, first of all, to hear the sort of somewhat, it sounded when you said a bunch of hippies, we think of hippies as idealists, but um, it's really exciting that uh, Hard Rock has embraced that ethos and actually shown that, you know, you can do good and do well as a business. Uh, and also when I see numbers like 1.2 million students are engaged in a project, that really can only come thanks to the significant investments that the private sector, private sector partners like Hard Rock are, are willing to make into a program like this because those numbers, uh, for those of us who are doing work in this field, we know those numbers are really hard to get. And then to thinking about to engage children in anything <laughs> um, that is educational is uh, is really impressive. So um, again, I wanna thank you for your partnership and use uh, this moment of gratitude to also thank my uh, really stellar director of education, Dr. Christian Tuala, um, who worked very closely uh, with Hard Rock, with Edunet to um, create the social identity quest and 
Uh, Dr. Twala, if you can join us, welcome to the conversation. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone out there. Thank you very much, Lori, for those kind words. My name is Dr. Bishan Twala, and I will be presenting um, the origins, exactly, and the design of what is the Social Identity Quest program in itself, right? Um, PowerPoint. I'll start off with this. Everything in nature has its origins, has its beginning. For us at, at ICPAT USA, we began with what is known now as the Youth Against Child Trafficking Curriculum, the WIAC curriculum. Till date, over 17,000 youth, parents, caregivers, and teachers have engaged in that curriculum. That's an extraordinary number, considering that we view it as it is not only the child that we must engage, but the community itself. Okay. That being said, we must also take a look at how we went designing this, right? Now, next slide, please. The curriculum is developed on the notion that everyone has to collaborate for the design to occur, right? It's not only educators or myself in this case, no. By what so means, that is not the answer. Survivors, youth, social workers, educators, parents, all came together to review, suggest, and even inform the curriculum in itself. Okay? This is based on the works of Ornstein, Pajak, and Ornstein. Also, we employ the backwards design in our curriculum. Why is that important? Because in order to look at the format, we must look at what the end, what do we want to achieve at the end, right? What do we want to achieve? Also, the foundation of this curriculum comes in building rapport. Our work at ECPAT USA is not engage and then leave, because if not, then the contribution doesn't mean as much. I can't say meaningless because it does mean something, but so many partnerships fail because one of the two parties or other parties leave the conversation. That is not our way of engaging in our communities. Why? Because in order to counter trafficking, human trafficking, we must engage with the community and build rapport to engage the youth. Only then can the youth begin to trust the individual teaching them or engaging them, right? If not, we're simply strangers. So here's a question that came up once we started engaging in this, right? We, we've reached over 17,000 students, but that's not enough. How can we reach more? How can we go about it? Pandemic hit. There was an increase in the use of technology, right? It was essential, it was necessary for kids to use technology in order to engage in their classes. But with that increase, it also increased the time they spent on social media, on gaming, right? And although our kids say that they know how to use the internet, they, they can tell you, look, I know what to watch out for. At times, that's not the case. Right? They don't know the ins and outs, what dangers might be lurking out there. Parents have an instinct and they know that there is a threat out there, but how do we engage? How do we go about it? Because digital literacy varies depending on age range within the United States. Here comes our partnership with Hard Rock International and Edu Network. Because if we're going to engage to prevent human trafficking, then we must use a tool that is accessible by all, in this case, technology in itself. And thus the idea for the social identity quest came to be. Next slide, please. One of the biggest questions that come always up is like, well, when you do this, right? When you go about engaging the schools, the community, what do you want to accomplish? How do you teach a child? Before we get to that question, the design has to come first. We're all experts in our, in our fields. That is true. But the true experts in the work against human trafficking is the work 
and the experience brought by survivors. They are the true experts. And this social identity quest was designed and revised by survivors who are also parents. And with that particular lens, we took it to the next step. Once our YAC curriculum was redesigned to fit a self-guided module, now we took it to the next level. At times, it's unfortunate. Communities dismiss kids. Why? Because the common misconception is you don't know. You don't know yet. You have to be older. But we forget that they are students. They spend time in schools and online far beyond what four hours, six hours, eight hours. So they must know something. And that's absolutely true. During our summer work, we actually engage with youth in a summer youth internship program. And their first task, very difficult task, was to look at the social identity quest framework and identify if it was good enough. The information was there, given by survivors. The strategies were there from educators and social workers. But were the examples good? This is when youth came about and say, no, it can be better. It can absolutely be better. And what a better way than go about it with their knowledge. They rapidly engaged and developed real, real world scenarios that made sense to youth. Identified and modified wording because it's a different language. And automatically, we, we engaged and made those corrections. It's easy to say, look, we're going to enter and going to teach the youth, but it doesn't stop there. The social identity quest holds information not only for the youth, but it holds information for the community. For if you go online and in a couple of minutes, you will get to see what this looks like, you will find information for educators and parents and caregivers. Because in order to prevent human trafficking, you must engage with the whole community. Engaging the youth is not enough. It begins the conversation, but it's not enough. Next slide, please. Now, the social identity quest initiates the conversation. 1.2 million youth engaged. It's absolutely fantastic. But the conversation continues. When we check up on several school districts that are using them, the conversation continues to take place because that's what the social identity quest calls for. Let me ask you a question, and I want you to really think about this. When you tell a child, don't do that, don't touch, what's more than likely going to happen? The child will test boundaries and will automatically touch or do something. Why? The intuitive, right? It's query. They want to know. Unfortunately, it can be dangerous, very, very dangerous. The social identity quest was designed in a way that we do not tell kids, don't do this, because that won't lead anywhere. Might lead with some, but not as a whole. But instead, let's have them think about the choices that they make, what can be a possibility, right? Could it be a positive? Could it be a negative consequence? What are the risks in taking a specific action? There's always an action to it. There's a reaction to an action, right? You look at growth. Paul shared with us 13% in literacy growth. To educators, that's called growth because growth is always good, right? Some of you might be thinking, well, 13% is not that big. I understand the number might be misleading, but here's the thing. It is just the beginning after the social quest. That means there's an interest. Rapport is beginning, and the teachers now will engage in the conversation. An initial growth of 13% is actually quite big. Moving forward by the end of the year, that is necessary to see a further growth. Remember, we are not teaching to a test, which educators out there automatically identify, and they will say, we don't teach to the test, which is great. We want to see growth. And in order to see growth, time is essential. This initiates the conversation. And what a better way to meet the youth where they're at, which is with technology. After that conversation takes place, 
the real preventive work continues, conversation has started, we will help the kids develop preventative measures. So that way they can make an informed decision or think twice perhaps about doing something because they might understand what the consequences might be. And once again, you see me going back to this particular concept, which is community is key to decrease the risk our youth face. And it's absolutely true because when kids have questions, they shouldn't only turn to educators or social workers for the answers because in reality, everyone is an educator. Parents, caregivers have experience and they should definitely be taken into account. And that's what the Social Identity Quest absolutely seeks to accomplish. At this moment, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Lori and we will share an example of what the Social Identity Quest looks like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. And so uh, I think what we're moving on to next, Valentina, hello. It's so lovely to see you. I'm very uh, pleased to introduce to our audience, Valentina Amate Perez, who is one of our youth uh, educators and she's a youth associate, and she's really been an integral part of the program that Christian mentioned, the Y Act program, the Youth Against Child Trafficking. He's really our front line, working with young people along with other really talented members of our Y Act staff. And Valentina, I understand you're here today. You're going to be demonstrating the Social Identity Quest. Yes. Yes, I will be. Thank you, Lori, for that intro. So hi, everyone. Like Lori just mentioned, my name is Valentina, and today I will be giving you a little demonstration of what this social identity quest looks like. So I'm sharing my screen now. I hope you all can see it. So when you first arrive at the website, you encounter this intro page where it explains what this quest on online safety is all about. And there's three different paths you can go down. You can go down the student path if you are a student, you can go down the educator path if you are an educator, and you can go down the parent or guardian path if you are a parent or guardian. And for the sake of today's demonstration, we're gonna go down the student path. So once you choose your path, you're taken to the beginning of the quest. And here you're shown the three different quests you can complete in whatever order you wish to complete. We have the virtual identity quest, we have the healthy online relationships quest, and we have the to text or not to text. Today, we'll be going through this first one, the virtual identity quest. And at the start of each quest, there's a short pre-survey that students are asked to complete, which they'll also complete once again at the end, once they complete the entire quest. Following this short survey, there's a little overview of the topics that will be covered through or during this particular quest and then begin the challenges. So here's an example of a challenge um, that students are asked to complete. Think before you post. Which picture will you post? So students are asked to choose between A, choosing a picture of their school schedule, or B, choosing a picture hanging out with their friends. So let's say the student chooses A. They want to post a picture of their schedule. They want to see who has the same classes as they do, right? Well, instead of telling them you're wrong or you're right or don't do this, we ask students to reflect a little more on the choice they made and think a little more deeply about it and why it might not be such a great and safe idea to post a personal piece of information like your school schedule online. And they also have a resource there that they can click on for additional information. Following this little reflective piece is the next challenge, knowing your friends. This is another example of a, of a challenge students can go through. So let's say you got a friend request from someone you don't know and you don't recognize them. What will you do? A, will you accept the friend request because you want a new friend, you're kind of bored, or B, will you not accept because, you know, it's not the best idea to do so. You don't know this person. Let's say they choose A, right? They choose to accept this friend request. Again, once they select their choice, they're not told you're wrong. This is horrible. This is not a safe choice. They're asked to reflect and they're given a little more information about what might come after accepting a request from someone you might not, not know. Why it might not be such a great idea to accept um, requests from strangers. And once they complete all the challenges, there's a reflective piece 
um, where they're asked to reflect on their own virtual identities and think about their online presence. And they're given a few things to consider, like have you set up privacy settings or are you mindful of the content you post? And then once again, they're linked to the resources that were given throughout all the challenges during this quest, including some articles like this one on a story about a survivor who was groomed online by a predator. And this is actually a survivor who is part of our survivors council and has helped a lot consulting for our program. So then following that, again, the three questions, the post survey. And the whole point of asking these questions again is to see maybe there might be a different answer this time around since they've already gone through all the challenges and has thought through some of these reflective questions. And that takes us through the end of one of the quests. And then once they finish that quest, they can go on to choose to do the other quest and just continue delving into this topic and what it means to have a safe online presence and how they can just make healthier, safer choices online and on social media. That takes us to the end of the demonstration. I'll stop sharing my screen real quick and I'll I'll shoot it back to you, Lori. Thanks, Valentina. Um, I, I just want to say it's it's so fun to see you engage with young people. And uh, we'll be talking later about how to access the quest. It's actually really fun. And one of the things I enjoyed doing was also like deliberately putting in the wrong answer just to see what would happen and see if I'd get scolded. And I do like the philosophy of this program that it's really not about chastising young people and, and telling them what they did wrong, but really help to guide them. And frankly, that's what they need. They, they don't want to be told what's right and wrong. And in many cases, they feel they know the internet better than adults do. Uh, and in some ways, they're right. But in some ways, they can be over trusting. So it's, uh, it's really wonderful. Also, that uh, we have been able to include the voices of our survivors council because uh, young people know what's real and what's fake and having it be survivor informed uh, is something clearly that uh, adolescents can pick up on. They'll know if we're making up fact patterns and, and whether this is authentic. And um, sadly, we, you know, there is a pool of people who have been exploited uh, that is significant, but we're grateful that they choose to share their expertise with us. So um, I, I really want to thank you for bringing this to so many young people. Um, and we, you know, as Paul and Valentina and, and Christian have, have mentioned, uh, we've, we've engaged 1.2 million children in the United States, but Hard Rock is a global enterprise and the ECPAT USA network, I mean, the ECPAT, not USA network, the ECPAT network uh, is global. And so we share the concern of trying to protect children globally. And so where else, uh, where's a better place to start than uh, with our neighbors in Mexico? And I'm very pleased to introduce Norma Elena Negrete Aguayo, who is the national coordinator of ECPAT Mexico and really an extraordinary expert on this topic. ECPAT Mexico has really been one of the bright stars in this work. And Norma, es un placer trabajar contigo de nuevo. And I'm uh, very excited that uh, she is here today to, to join us and to speak about what's, what is ECPAT Mexico uh, doing in, in connection with the social identity quest. So Norma, muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Lori. Muy buenos días a todas y todos. Quiero agradecer eh, profundamente a ECPAT USA, a Lori, a Cristian, y a todo su maravilloso equipo por invitarme y sobre todo por facilitar las herramientas para estar hoy con ustedes. Eh, saludo al resto de los integrantes de la mesa, Paul, eh, Valentina, Dorante, y a los asistentes en esta sala. Eh, bueno, inicio diciendo que nada más asertivo que convocar este espacio de reflexión e intercambio con el título de Tecnología Atractiva 
para prevenir la explotación sexual comercial de niñas, niños y adolescentes en línea. Voy a dividir mi presentación en tres momentos. Primero, un panorama general de México a través de algunos datos duros. En un segundo momento hablaré de un estudio que realizamos en México con jóvenes sobrevivientes de abuso y explotación sexual comercial en línea. Y en el tercer bloque, y para cerrar mi intervención, algunas reflexiones respecto a la relevancia de llevar el proyecto Búsqueda de Identidad Social a México. Pasamos, por favor. En México debo decir que una de cada tres personas es menor de edad, es decir, menor de 18 años. Eh, con información de UNICEF, 50% de las niñas y niños que tienen entre 6 y 11 años son usuarios de internet o de una computadora. Y en el caso de los adolescentes entre los 12 y 17 años de edad, eh, el, la cifra aumenta entre un 80 y 94% que usan internet o bien una computadora. De acuerdo con el Instituto Nacional de Estadística y Geografía, INEGI, 17.7 millones de personas de 12 años y más, es decir, el 21.7% de la población que utilizan internet fueron eh, eh, durante el 2021 vivieron algún tipo de acoso cibernético. De este porcentaje eh, y de esta cifra, al menos el eh, 9.7 millones que representan la mitad fueron mujeres. Cabe destacar que eh, los mayores porcentajes de ciberacoso se registraron entre las personas jóvenes de 12 a 29 años de edad. Por su parte, también las autoridades eh, federales en México advirtieron de un incremento considerable de crímenes digitales, violencia en Internet y tráfico en línea de pornografía que utiliza a personas menores de 18 años eh, durante los eh, primeros meses de confinamiento por la pandemia del COVID-19. Un aumento, sí, de más del 107%, de acuerdo a la propia Unidad de Investigaciones Financieras en el país. Ya para eh, junio del 2022 también se reporta que dos de cada tres víctimas de trata son mujeres y el 51% de estas víctimas son personas menores de 18 años de edad. ¿Pasamos? Hasta aquí la evidencia nos señala que las tecnologías digitales ofrecen una nueva puerta de entrada para que los agresores sexuales abusen y exploten sexualmente a niñas, niños y adolescentes a través de diversas formas y estrategias. Bajo este duro contexto, en los primeros meses de ese mismo año, del 2022, lanzamos a nivel mundial el resultado de un estudio sin precedentes que reúne la voz de más de 50 sobrevivientes de abuso y explotación sexual comercial en línea de seis países del mundo, tres en Europa del Este y tres en América Latina, Albania, Bosnia y Moldovia, y para América, Colombia, México y Perú. Acá solo eh, presentaré algunos hallazgos, pocos de ellos por el tiempo, en México. Eh, decir primeramente que las, el participante en México, eh, son jóvenes cuya edad promedio actual es de 20 años y en su mayoría son universitarios. Sin embargo, la edad eh, promedio del evento traumático, es decir, del abuso o explotación sexual en línea, sucedió a los 13 años de edad. Eh, destaco que 7 de los 10 casos están judicializados. Y en todos los casos, el agresor sexual directo fue un hombre adulto. En las conversaciones que se mantuvieron con él y las 10 jóvenes sobrevivientes, se observa el uso del entorno digital por parte de los agresores en varias modalidades. 
con la finalidad siempre de abusar y explotar sexualmente a sus víctimas y sacar un beneficio a cambio, ya sea comercializando con sus cuerpos o violentando su intimidad, integridad y dignidad. Se identificaron al menos cinco formas en las que los agresores están coaccionando, manipulando, abusando y explotando a, a, a las eh, adolescentes específicamente. Los ejemplos compartidos por él y las jóvenes así lo muestran. Primero, promoción y comercialización de las personas a través de páginas de internet. Segundo, a través del enamoramiento como un medio de enganche. Otro diferenciado a este como grooming es el acercamiento para ganarse la confianza. Sobre todo eh, proviene de personas cercanas al círculo familiar. Y la violencia y extorsión digital mediante la exposición de material sexual ya sea autoproducido o no consensuado. Por último, el acoso y hostigamiento digital hasta llegar a la violación sexual. Los entornos y agresores eh, que se detectaron en general son dentro del propio contexto familiar, la figura de la madre, el padrastro y algún primo o pariente eh, cercano al primer al primer círculo familiar. En la escuela, los maestros, las propias autoridades escolares y también los compañeros de mayor grado. Dentro de la comunidad laica eclesiástica también detectamos líderes juveniles laicos que se incorporan a estos grupos para poder eh, acercarse a, a las y los adolescentes y poder llevar a cabo estas eh, actividades delictivas. Y dentro de la comunidad digital tenemos desde los novios, clientes explotadores y proxenetas virtuales. En cuanto a los medios digitales, son muy diversos, pues se menciona una variedad de páginas de internet, redes sociales, plataformas de mensajería y también de manera muy importante, los videojuegos. Algunos como Locant, eh, WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook, Messenger, eh, Chat, en fin. Sin duda, me queda claro y, y, y con estos datos podemos eh, reafirmar que las tecnologías son una herramienta indispensable y de enorme relevancia en la vida actual. En cuestión de segundos, estamos comunicados en tiempo real de un lado a otro del mundo. Podemos visitar las más importantes e interesantes eh, destinos, museos y bibliotecas de cualquier parte del mundo. Se procesan millones y millones de datos en segundos. Se tienen almacenado la mayor cantidad de información de la sociedad que la sociedad ha producido hasta hoy. Pero también hoy, es, hoy estamos testificando unos pasos más en la revolución digital a través de la llamada inteligencia artificial. Sin embargo, también las tecnologías tienen impactos negativos que no debemos dejar de reflexionar y afrontar de manera creativa y atractiva desde las mismas herramientas tecnológicas. De frente al incremento en el tiempo del uso de Internet que están haciendo nuestras niñas, niños y adolescentes, eh, primeramente motivados durante la pandemia, pero ahora también eh, post pandemia, ya sea para efectos educativos o sociales o incluso recreativos, las y los adolescentes necesitan tener información de manera sencilla, veraz, oportuna y actualizada, utilizando las mismas herramientas digitales y conocer de la voz de otras y otros adolescentes que vivieron 
experiencias de violencia sexual digital y explotación sexual con componentes en línea, así como de las medidas a tomar en cuenta para prevenir o también actuar frente a estos delitos. Este fascinante proyecto educativo denominado Búsqueda de la Identidad Social, en alianza ahora tripartita con ECPATUSA, Hard Rock y ECPAT México, estamos seguros será de gran aportación para una navegación corresponsable de las y los adolescentes, sus familias y docentes en algunas de las escuelas de nivel básico en comunidades turísticas de México, en nuestro país, en donde la problemática de la explotación sexual comercial se agudiza aún más debido a múltiples factores eh, que están presentes en estos destinos, tanto sociales como económicos, que, los, que les dan características muy particulares. También identificamos retos, por supuesto, y uno de ellos eh, es cómo podemos a partir de esta experiencia que estamos iniciando, que estamos eh, empezando a actualizar también para México, cómo podemos ampliar estas alianzas y acciones para llegar a un mayor número de población y a diferentes regiones de nuestro país, incluso donde eh, las tecnologías llegan de manera todavía muy escasa pero siempre también contextualizando y actualizando la información de acuerdo al momento y de acuerdo a las exigencias contextuales. Para nosotros en el PAD México es fundamental esta herramienta. Estamos muy eh, complacidos y muy contentos de ser parte de esta importante herramienta y estamos seguros que podremos compartir muy próximamente algunos datos también ya de su implementación en nuestro país. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Norma, por esta información indispensable. Gracias por seguir la protección de niños, niñas y adolescentes con NECPAT México. Um, everyone, it, uh, I just want to mention that uh, ECPAT USA was very fortunate to partner with ECPAT Mexico and ECPAT Guatemala uh, in looking at the uh, impact of COVID-19 on youth in uh, Northern Central America and Mexico. And uh, one of the things we looked at was the, the use of technology, which surged during the pandemic. And uh, in my mind, one of the Uh, most moving quotes was uh, someone involved in child protection that talked about, as Norma mentioned, both the benefits and the risks of this technology. Uh, and they said, uh, this technology is a double-edged sword. It's very powerful, un arma de doble filo. And uh, we're very excited to continue to work with ECPAT Mexico and Hard Rock to make sure that when we're looking at this double-edged sword, we're really focusing on the protection side. Um, and as we look towards what's next in the future, where are we going? Um, I am extremely honored to introduce our next speaker, uh, Durante Blaze Billy, who is a member of the Seminole Tribe of Florida, an activist and an educator there, and also serving as the social responsibility specialist at Hard Rock International. Um, Durante, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor for me to be on this panel with all of you. I'm going to share my screen for a moment. So what I'll be talking about today is through Hard Rock, um, trying to develop programming for indigenous youth, which is prevention focused. So the first step in adapting prevention programming for Indigenous youth is asking ourselves, why do we need to create programming that's separate from the existing English language social identity quest? You know, how are Indigenous youth a key population for prevention? 
how are Indigenous youth uniquely impacted by child exploitation? So to start, Indigenous youth are uniquely impacted by the crisis of online child exploitation for many of the same reasons they are uniquely impacted by the wider human trafficking crisis. The associated vulnerability factors for child exploitation, such as poverty, homelessness, limited access to education, placement into foster care, and history of sexual abuse and violence are all factors that disproportionately affect Indigenous communities. Historically, the US government rulings and actions such as removal, extermination, and assimilation policies, religious persecution, forced migration into Indian reservations, and the systematic removal of native children into boarding schools cause not only generational trauma within indigenous families and communities, but have had long-term and well-documented effects. Those impacts being widespread poverty, low educational attainment, high rates of community and interpersonal violence, high rates of alcohol-related deaths, high rates of suicide, poor physical health, and high rates of child involvement in welfare systems. For example, based on the data from the 2018 US Census, Native Americans have the highest poverty rate amongst all ethnic groups in the United States. The national poverty rate for Native Americans at the time of the census was 25.4%. In addition to these vulnerability factors, there are unique barriers for prevention education and services for survivors. The prevention of child exploitation requires coordinated responses and actions from multiple individuals, agencies, including parents, child welfare workers like foster care workers, law enforcement officers, medical workers, school administrators and teachers, and the court system. Engagement with all of these things has a unique set of expectation and rules for indigenous youth when compared to the general population of the US due to the colonial systems put in place by the federal government. For example, an indigenous youth that is enrolled in a federally recognized tribe or who lives on a reservation can find themselves navigating a completely separate system of healthcare, of family courts, of foster care, and of even school due to the complex intersections of tribal sovereignty and federal jurisdiction. Indigenous youth are also uniquely impacted by online child exploitation and need unique prevention measures because this key population group is historically left out of national actions and conversations around child sexual exploitation. So we do not know the full extent of their risks and vulnerabilities. While we have data clear enough to identify high vulnerability factors, a huge issue for Indigenous youth is a lack of data collected by national agencies and organizations about the exploitation of indigenous youth specifically. In the justice system, we find inconsistent and inaccurate data about indigenous youth involved in child exploitation. And that's a result of racial miscoding and a lack of systematic methods to track the number of native victims being processed. For national organizations combating child sexual exploitation, the small population group of Indigenous youth, with Indigenous peoples making up only 2.09% of the U.S. population, and the most vulnerable Indigenous populations being located in very rural places, um, create barriers for accurate data collection. This then creates a clear gap in prevention services and survivor services, where Indigenous populations are neither identified nor prioritized. Even though with the incomplete data we have, we can see that the representation of Indigenous youth in cases of child sexual exploitation is oftentimes far greater than their representation in general populations across the country. All of this is not to say that prevention work is not being done, but we often see it on a local community-driven scale. There are a few national organizations, such as the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center or the Sovereign Bodies Institute, that distribute prevention education that focuses specifically on Indigenous youth. While these Indigenous focused organizations often partner with national organizations to address the gaps, there is still much room for development and much more work can be done to fight the perceived invis invisibility of Indigenous youth in the crisis of child exploitation. However, in the existing education and prevention material addressing Indigenous child sexual exploitation, 
there is a distinct lack of education around online safety for Indigenous youth and a lack of interactive material beyond PDFs, which are oftentimes aimed only at care providers and guardians rather than focused on directly engaging with youth. So in approaching this adaptation, what are our driving concerns? Our main concern in creating this programming is integrity and relevancy for Indigenous youth. Our aim is not to just indigenize the program we currently have by ingesting the language or imagery, but to approach Indigenous programming without assuming that Indigenous youth prevention has the same needs or wants that we established with the previous version of the Social Identity Quest. We want to make sure we are truly listening and address the unique needs of Indigenous communities instead of trying to force a one-size-fits-all solution. Before any work on an adaptation is done, we need to approach this from a border crossing mentality. Even though this project is being led by an Indigenous person, myself, we are not an Indigenous-run organization, even though we may be Indigenous-owned. And in engaging with other Indigenous communities outside of the Seminole tribe, we need to recognize and acknowledge that at the end of the day, we are a corporation, not a part of their community, and we need to respect their boundaries. For us, that means being completely transparent about our capacity to support, as well as having clearly communicated and consented entrance and exit strategies. We want to avoid approaching this as saviors that overpromise. Nor do we want to be strangers that assume a solution for a problem we perceive without having been invited or asked to contribute by the community. This leads to our interest in partnering and co-creation with an already established Indigenous organization already doing the prevention work in this field. We want to make sure this programming is not only validated by Indigenous communities, Indigenous survivors, and Indigenous experts, but we want to support them to lead and inform all aspects they want to the extent that they have capacity or investment. We do not want our relationship with Indigenous communities to be extractive, where we are receiving their knowledge and employing it how we see fit. But rather, we want to devote our capacity to supporting a Native organization with already established trust and collaborative relationships with Indigenous youth, survivors, and experts. So they can see how prevention work needs to be done in Indigenous communities. We also don't want to assume the best distribution channels for this programming. We've seen that with our previous iteration of Social Identity Quest, um, that it's been very successful in the school system, but we don't want to assume that that will have the same impact in Indigenous communities. So we want to recognize that lots of Native organizations already have structures in place for this kind of distribution and honor those structures rather than having to cross into borders of each Indigenous community we wish to engage with. We also recognize that while hard rock branding and recognition benefited us in the success of the social identity quest, corporate branding and ownership may alienate indigenous youth who are historically tokenized. This is another reason we want to come from a place of genuine co-creation and partnership with an established indigenous organization to prevent barriers of mistrust or unfamiliarity. So based on this, how do we anticipate our existing programming to be modified? Well, we've already discussed branding under Seminole Gaming, um, a really big benefit of being owned by the Seminole Tribe as Hard Rock International is that we also work really close, closely with Seminole Gaming, which is the Seminole Tribe's you know, other entity for um, gaming. Uh, we hope to illustrate that we are a native owned corporation with an invested interest in the well-being of indigenous peoples beyond just that of a mainstream hospitality brand. We hope to partner with an indigenous organization with our top pick being National Indigenous Women's Resource Center and serve as a support to their leadership. We also want them to have co-ownership or ownership over this programming. Until we receive validation and input from indigenous youth, survivors and experts, we also can't fully anticipate the extent that the programming will be modified. It can be completely separate from the iteration we know now, or it could be only slightly modified. As well, distribution channels that we've been previously using need to be adjusted and modified to make sure that key populations within indigenous communities are being met and connected with. I anticipate this to be a slight challenge because 
distribution channels vary from indigenous community to indigenous communities, with some indigenous communities using healthcare systems to get this education out, others using boys and girls clubs to get this education out, or some using their tribal government. So we hope to heavily rely on our partnership to sort of illustrate what would be the most structured and least invasive distribution channel for this. Um, the resources provided in the social identity quest and in this indigenous adaptation of it will need to be um, greatly added to, to include hotlines that are specific to indigenous people, education guides that are specific to indigenous people and the problems they face, and really showing that we understand how indigenous communities are uniquely impacted and providing them with service that uniquely meets their needs. Um, further anticipations is that due to the nature of colonization, indigenous adaptation may also be needed for Mexico. And should the hard rock or seminal gaming ever expand into Canada, an indigenous version would also be needed there since in both of these territories, indigenous people are also disproportionately affected by human trafficking. Thank you all for listening. I'll end my screen share there. Thank you, Durante. That was so uh, inspiring and really very moving. Um, I really appreciate the tremendous sense of humility that you bring to this process and uh, it's something that many of us could learn from, that uh, the idea of taking something that has been so successful and translating it, translation is not simply about translating terminology, translating images, it's really making sure that the concepts themselves resonate as authentic. And um, I, I really appreciate the leadership that you're bringing to this conversation. Um, I do want to mention ECPAT USA Survivors Council. We have both um, survivors who were born in the United States and survivors who were born abroad, who were trafficked in this country. And we have indigenous Mexicans. And indeed, as you um, mentioned that, you know, this, this is an issue not only in the United States, but also uh, in, in Mexico, in Canada, and, and un unfortunately, globally where indigenous communities have been marginalized. And um, we appreciate your elevating that uh, as we're all sharing in this joint mission to educate children so that they can make empowered decisions to protect themselves. Um, we are at the conclusion of the, the presentation by our panelists. I know there's been an extremely active uh, Q and A board that's been running and we've answered some of the uh, questions that have appeared. I mean, I know that one question that appeared repeatedly was information about how to access the social identity quest. Um, Christian, would you mind talking about ways in which people could access the social identity quest? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Lori. Um, I have just placed in the chat the link to the social identity quest. Also, uh, what we can do for those of you that registered, we can send out an email in which it includes the link as a thank you for participating in this. I urge you, please share the information as information is key um, to prevent human trafficking. Thank you. And this is something that you can feel safe distributing on social media. So please go ahead and, and share it widely. Um, do we have uh, additional questions in the chat? Let me see what we have here. Okay. Uh, Christian, we may need to send an updated, ah, somebody wrote it wrote back in. Thank you, anonymous attendee, www.socialidentityquest.com. It says maybe down temporarily. So Christian, um, we can check that and, and make sure. Oh, Christian, can you check and see? It looks like maybe it's not www.socialidentityquest. It's just socialidentityquest.com without the www. Is that right? I am actually currently checking um, based on what I put in the chat and it it does come up. 
I will triple check right now um, with our text to see what's going on, but it should open up. Um, while I'm on microphone, I, I see another question. Please address lessons learned in the process of designing and implementing this initiative. I can speak on that if that's okay, Lori. There's an open question. Uh, there are a couple of lessons actually learned within the design, and I'll speak to that specifically. It varies, and this is why the information and the language used in the social identity quest is made general, but there is an opportunity for educators to make it more targeted. Depending on the states, in the United States, depending on the states and city that you use, the language that kids use, necessarily the slang that they might use or the scenarios that may come across, vary, including applications, games, and it also the age range. When we initiated conversations with our youth, uh, one of the things that came across was when I asked, hey, is Facebook still relevant? They laughed at me. Um, and I quite literally enjoyed it because I learned something. And they said, well, to be quite honest, in our age range, uh, which would be the high school age range, we don't use Facebook that much. That's for older kids, adults. Um, and once again, they found me humorous. And they said, we actually use Instagram, TikTok. Um, and when I asked about um, what's it called, um, WhatsApp, they actually said, no, not so much. But in conversations also with ECPEC Mexico, we understand that WhatsApp is actually used, highly used in Mexico. So it depends on the region um, and, and the cities. That being said, um, we try to use, and, and the kids actually did a, an excellent job at this, um, general terms that they would all understand and communicate. That's one of the biggest lessons learned. Um, another lesson learned is sometimes that incentives work. I actually see that a lot of participants are asking with regards to incentives. At times, the educators, and this is um, positive behavior, but part of behaviorism within the educator education field of like, perhaps giving an incentives for participating in it, right? When educators engage in their classes and say like, hey kids, we're gonna do this right now. Um, sometimes there might be a reluctance, not because they don't wanna address the issue, or perhaps it is, sometimes because it's something else, it's academic. So we try to take away that academic aspect to it and make it a little bit more relevant, make it more fun because it's not a test, it's not a class sort of right so that was one of the biggest lessons learned and we've had heard we've heard from educators that this actually results in a positive thing so they man they have ways of actually introducing this to the kids so they take interest in it um and those are some of the lessons that we've learned particularly with the kids um i'll be glad to answer any more questions that come around thank you thanks christian Let's see if we have additional Ah, Paul, this is a really good question for you, and I'm excited to hear your answer. Um, appreciate all of Hard Rock's efforts to prevent trafficking and advocate for survivors. Is the company engaging peer companies and trade associations, such as the National Restaurant Association, on how they can contribute to this important effort? Great. Well, thank you very much for that question. The short answer is we are. Um, on the restaurant side, uh, that is, we've not yet um, engaged uh, that association in particular, though we, we could in the future. The um, uh, Our focus has been on hotels and casinos in terms of our operations, because that is the, those are the businesses that are most directly affected. So um, I'm a member of the American Gaming Association's Human Trafficking Task Force. And we are working actively with that group. So all of my counterparts from the, across the gaming industry, both, casinos uh, and, and online uh, gaming companies. And we are working on common trainings, uh, common um, frameworks for programs and sharing practices. So for example, the QR code that I showed you for victims um, that, that'll be posted on, uh, on the property, we're gonna be sharing the experience of that pilot with, uh, with that organization. And, and if, if uh, other companies wanna take up that practice, we can see that QR code uh, literally across the gaming industry in the United States. Just to give you one example, um, the cafes, uh, the cafe business, we do want to engage them. And so once we establish some of these things, we will reach out uh, to that, that part of our business as well. But again, uh, more frequently, human trafficking touches our hotel and casino business. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. 
Paul, that's really helpful. And Hard Rock's been a leader, particularly in the gaming industry. So I want to thank you for that. And one of the things you mentioned during your presentation is that it's essential to discuss this, that as a business model, you can't pretend it's not happening. And so uh, you're acknowledging and then taking the next step, which is really leadership in the industry. Um, to the person who asked this question, I do want to mention, and I'll put in the chat, uh, ECPAT USA has been very fortunate to partner with the American Hotel and Lodging Association uh, and with Marriott International on hosting a free online training for the hotel industry. Uh, and what's been interesting about that is as with um, the social identity quest, uh, it's received more than uh, a million people have engaged with uh, this program as well. Uh, it's an online resource and it's available for free on the ECPAT USA website. The other resource that I want to mention that similarly is a very uh, a tremendously useful and informative uh, tool is we have uh, a learning segment for travel professionals, and that was generously hosted by uh, Carlson, and which is a uh, um, really has has taken a leadership role and was one of the first. Uh, partners with ECPAT USA and the first uh, company in the United States to sign our code of conduct for responsible businesses and in, in preventing child trafficking and exploitation. So I'll put that link in the chat um, as well. And I, while I'm putting that in the link, I see there is a question for Norma uh, and I hope the interpreter is able to translate this for Norma, otherwise our team will uh, move ahead with the translation. Can you envision how the social identity quest could be used as you suggested for those who have less or no access to technology or are in more geographically hard to access locations? Gracias. Sí, debo decir que en este momento nosotros estamos trabajando con el proyecto no solo en la adaptación a los contextos locales en los cuales se va a implementar eh, en cuanto al lenguaje, en cuanto a la situación misma de, del entorno, sino también a estas dificultades que se presentan en la escuela pública en nuestro país respecto al uso mismo de Internet o la calidad del uso de Internet en las escuelas públicas. Estamos justamente ahora eh, visualizando cómo podemos fortalecer esa parte también de la mano con eh, las autoridades educativas, de manera tal que eh, en algunas de estas escuelas eh, de nivel básico eh, de públicas puedan tener un mejor acceso a, al Internet. También lo estamos considerando en aquellos centros comunitarios para los eh, adolescentes que no están dentro del sistema educativo regular, pero que pueden asistir a espacios, eh, de, digamos, ya consolidados, como son los centros comunitarios en algunos de estos lugares turísticos. Y en estos mismos espacios fortalecer la línea eh, de internet de manera tal que puedan tener un mejor acercamiento y un acceso a este tipo de herramientas. Sin duda, cada vez se está trabajando más también en, en el país en una conectividad universal en que todos puedan tener eh, acceso a esta, a, al internet como tal. Sin embargo, bueno, eh, eh, está el desafío en cuanto a poder fortalecer esta parte en los espacios en los que iniciemos con eh, la promoción de, de, esta, eh, de este interesante proyecto y cómo también poder proyectarlo hacia otros espacios, insisto, como centros comunitarios para aquellos eh, adolescentes que no están en el sistema educativo regular, pero que sí tienen eh, la necesidad de poder eh, trabajar también en la corresponsabilidad de su navegación en línea respecto a la eh, problemática de la explotación sexual comercial.
Muchísimas gracias, Norma. Um, we have uh, time for one more question, uh, which I think I'll, uh, looks like it's a good question for Christian. Um, how can the social identity quest be used to promote more frank conversations between children and parents to enhance online safety to protect children? That's a great question, to be quite honest. Um, and, and here's an honest answer. It's difficult, right? Parents, parents and kids, uh, trust is important. Like in any relationship, trust is important. One of the great things about the social identity quest is that you'll find a parent caregiver guide to it, which will link you to ECPAT USA's guide for parents, in which you will find prompts in which you will have conversation starters, right? ECPAT USA, this is a side conversation actually, but very related. ECPAT USA actually has a separate program that I, ideally it equips parents to have those dis, um, difficult conversations with their children because it is a topic that requires a lot of finesse. In some cases more than so. It also varies depending on age of the, of the child. Um, but please feel free, one, to check out that within the social identity quest, you will have a link to conversation starters for a parent's guide. And also as a separate program, but very related, how to start those conversations. Um, and as an added, added piece, I would say, the fact that there's no definite answer, there's no right or wrong, um, it actually pushes and encourages the child, the youth in this case, to ask the question. Because kids are so used to saying like, oh, there's a right and a wrong answer. But when they're in, when that piece is missing, they'll have questions. And it begins at the school because this might be introduced at school. And when the teacher says, gives them a, an answer that perhaps they're not satisfied, guess who they'll turn? Their educator at home, which is the parent caregiver or guardian. And this is where the conversation can start. And if you're a parent, please do not be deterred by this. Experience counts a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. And uh, as parents, I have to say that I have learned uh, from this program of the benefits of not giving the answer, of not saying what's right, what's wrong. So um, thank you for helping me with my own parenting. Uh, I do want to add that uh, ECPAT USA separately has a program that's not part of the Social Identity Request that's really focused on parents. And if people are interested in, in having that training brought to your school or to your community organization, you can feel free to email us at info at ecpatusa.org. It's a very different type of presentation and um, not, unfortunately, not gamified. So um, probably uh, less fun than the, the social identity quest is currently for young people. Um, that concludes this presentation today. Um, I really wanna thank everyone for joining us. I know the CSW week has so many uh, fascinating and really important presentations. It means a lot that you were here to spend your time with us. And I wanna thank uh, all of our presenters today. You all bring so many valuable um, and, and varied perspectives on this. And really this is a global effort, a global movement to ensure that every child grows up free from the threat of sexual exploitation. So thank you so much. Um, again, if there are any questions, feel free to reach us at info at petusa.org. And as Christian mentioned, um, we will again make available the link to the social identity quest to the attendees. This concludes our presentation.